So we'll just get started. Um, won't be rushing, you know, won't be going too quickly or moving along too quickly. So hopefully anyone who joins us late will um, will be able to catch up. Uh, just please let me know if you are having any trouble uh, hearing me. Uh, so first off, I'd just like to welcome everyone um, and thank you for allowing me to present um, a little bit about uh, Sona, uh, our product, which is called MP Precise uh, and Continuous Code Inspection to you um, this morning. So this is a replay of a session that we've done previously, um, which is also available on our website in the... Um, In the video section um, under replays, if you do want to re uh, watch this again, uh, tutorials, videos, then um, this one goes through in a bit more detail uh, training videos. So, um, to kick off, what are we what are we actually trying to do? Or what's some what's the point of this presentation? So, this presentation is about um, writing basically writing cheap code uh, for message broker so um, when we say cheap code what exactly do we mean by cheap code so we don't mean code written by people that we've asked or outsourced to in the middle of nowhere that um, will work for a dollar now what, what we mean by cheap code is writing the uh, the code that gives us the best long-term value for our organization so when we mean long-term value we mean um, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do um, is it bug free? Does it perform well? And can it be understood and maintained? So by writing code that's uh, that's bug free, that um, does what it's supposed to do and uh, is, it can be changed and maintained um, um, easily by developers, we're developing code or we're giving code to the business that um, we can change over time with uh, an expected or a reasonable amount of um, cost not an excessive amount of cost. So the more complicated code becomes, the harder it is to change, the more expensive it is to change, and the more likely it's to cause defects in the future. And those defects can be very expensive from an operational perspective and from an organization's um, dealings with their customers. So just um, we're just going to cover a few terms here, just so we're, uh, just so we're talking about the same thing. So... Um, if we came from a non-message broker world, if we we're dealing with, say, Java or C Sharp, um, mainly Java, these are uh, uh, these other um, products we're going to talk about in a second. Come from the Java world, would have a tool set to allow allow us to write um, good, clean code. Now, the tool sets um, that this particular product for message broker is mimicking um, are the fine bugs, with fine bugs, which we'll just talk about quickly. So find bugs for Java um, just basically has a whole bunch of checks that it does against you, uh, statically runs against your code to try and tell you a little bit about your code, about um, whether or not there's going to be expected problems. So um, in the Java world, this might be things like synchronization blocks, where um, if you've got a piece of threaded code, call another piece of threaded code, and there's a potential, uh, potential deadlock, Fine bugs will try to um, locate the code where that could be a, an issue and, and tell you about it. So in the case of our products, we we also have similar checks. So we have things like uh, in ESQL where atomics are uh, calling other atomic sections. So we have a potential for a deadlock situation. So fine bugs is one of those uh, is an important tool for um, preventing defects and. By preventing, um, also for um, creating correct programs. Jigsaw um, is another product that uh, enforces coding standards, or tells you about where you've uh, where you've deviated from coding standards. So um, this could be a number of different things. It could be the length of a um, the length of a line. It could be the naming standards for uh, variables, could be the naming standard for constants, could be the naming standards for procedures or methods. Uh, in the case of um, in the case of message rig, we're talking about naming standards for modules, uh, functions, and procedures. 
So this is important because the more consistent the code is, the, the fewer, the easier it is for uh, new developers to, to understand, and ideally it's easy for existing developers to go back and refactor and understand what the code is if the if the code just if the code describes what the process is. Um, and you get fewer if you um, stick to say intention revealing names, you get fewer surprises, which means you more likely have fewer bugs if the code's doing what the um, if the code's actually doing what the um, the comments and the names suggest. So uh, so check style helps um, improve productivity by making uh, the code easy to maintain, but also helps to prevent bugs by helping to enforce the coding standards around names. So PMD is another um, Java product. Um, so PMD itself um, is very similar to find bugs. Um, so it does some very very similar sort of checks, but I think the, the interesting thing about PMD is it does something called uh, CPD or copy paste detection. Um, so you CPD or copy paste detection is useful because um, it tells us where we've got code which is um, uh, similar or the same throughout our program. Um, so what that means for a developer is if I'm writing a, a particular piece of code and, and I have a common piece of functionality, say convert dollars to cents, for example, if I've written that particular piece of functioning all over the place, um, it's very difficult for other developers to follow to know which one, which particular um, dollar to cents function we're talking about. What that also means if I'm, if I'm duplicating code all over the place, um, if there is a bug or the logic needs to change, then I've got a whole lot of places I need to change and potentially a whole lot of places in the code I need to regression test. Um, and it's also it's confusion because if you change one and not the other, then sometimes developers aren't sure which one they're talking about, so they can miss something. Um, so PMD aims to um, so PMD aims to help us work out where we've where we've duplicated our code so that we can um, so we could remediate that and uh, get back to a single source for our code. Let me just uh, pause for a second. Does anyone have any questions before I keep going? I'll continue on. So, so we market our, our, our product, MB, MB Precise, as fine bugs, check style, and PMD, but for message brokers. So we have we have synthesized or made similar checks that these three products um, that do for Java and, and the other language, sort of uh, languages that do um, for different languages, um, and we do all these checks for. Well, sorry, I take that back. We we do a lot of these checks for Message Broker. So at the moment we've got about 166, 166, 167 checks across various types of Message Broker um, development. So we've got checks across our ESQL. We've got checks against message flows. We've got checks against schemas. We've got checks against style sheets. We've got checks against maps. So, what we're aiming to do is enforce coding standards. So, being very similar to what Check Style is doing, coding standards for uh, style sheet names, ESQL file names, message flow names, subflow names, uh, node names, MQ net definition names, things like that. Um, and then from each of those other different ways of, of developing message record code, we have additional checks, so a whole bunch of checks, for, particularly for SQL. And then we have some correctness checks to make sure that, say, the SQL is, is compatible with the, the message flow. So, for example, where we have a compute node, we've got to check this is if you've got a compute node, and you've got a compute node that has a different, um, like a couple of different um, exits, um, that those exits map what the, um, the SQL is capable of doing. But we can get into that a bit more detail when we go through the demonstration. The next term I want to uh, touch on is one called is technical debt. Um, I believe this was coined by Martin Fowler a few years ago, but um, technical debt is just a way of explaining to the business or management the overall cost of maintaining code. Um, so what we're looking at technical debt is we're looking at how do we present um, the the quality of the code in a way that trans translates into how much the quality slows down future development. 
So the lower level, the lower the amount of technical debt, the easier it is to maintain your software, and the easier easier it is to to add features without having to um to refactor a rework or um understand um deficiencies in the code. The higher the amount of technical debt, the harder it is for new developers to make changes or existing developers to make changes, and the the more costlier is those changes are and changes are in the long run. So um, what we're aiming to do with this plugin and with the checks and checks that we do is is by re continuously reporting back the uh, number of defects or potential defects in the code and the number of coding violations that developers have we're aiming to minimize those those uh, coding violations over time to help Im help improve the quality of the code over time and help limit or lower the technical debt that um, people are dealing with so by lowering the technical debt or keeping the technical debt uh, at a relatively low level we're um we're writing cheap code going forward in the future or making making uh, maintenance um a new development um, more cost effective and easy to predict and cost wise. Continuous integration is a, is an agile practice where when you write code, um, um, because code in uh, different teams might be writing different parts of the code and different. Um, or in different parts of the organization or potentially writing it with outside parties these um these different uh, contracts between different components um need to be tested so continuous integration is a set of tools which allows code to be continuously um built and continuously deployed and continuously tested together to make sure that um to make sure that any inconsistencies between um what's been decided between different teams are, um, are understood and, and taken into account earlier as possible. So um, so we try to do uh, continuous integration um, often so that we know that, uh, that we know that we're not um, inheriting any issues which will uh, affect us because we haven't uh, understood exactly how we're going to be um, working with other parts of the system. Continuous delivery is, is a process or a, a, a methodology where the code that you have is maintained in such a state that um, you can, in theory, deliver it to your customer pretty much any time you want. Um, so what that means is rather than going through a long cycle of writing some code and having a really long cycle of testing and having a, 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 a preparation and then finally giving to the customer, um, what continuous delivery aims to do is um, allow you to allow a developer to make changes, say you know, Monday, allow um, the continuous integration server to build that change on, on Monday to make sure that that change is compatible. Then your whatever code uh, code test switch you have might run on Tuesday to make sure that um, the code sort of works. You might have some integration testing on Wednesday. And then potentially you might be able to deliver the code, working code, to a customer, say Wednesday. So a couple of days after developers actually check some code in, after you've gone through a pipeline of checks and, and checks and balances. Um, and one of those, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, and one of the, um, one of the tenets, tenets of being able to do continuous delivery is is being able to continuously inspect your code. So if you cannot, um, if you can develop code, integrate code, that's all well and good. But if you can't check the quality of the code um, through either a peer review or some sort of automatic process, then it's um, then it's a risk to deliver that code to a, to a customer without knowing about the quality of that code. So if you may have passed all your tests and you may have been able to do your regression testing, but if you if you understand that you've, um, through continuous code inspection, that you've potentially put a performance issue in, then you probably don't want to deliver that code to a customer because you may not have caught, you may not have caught that performance issue. So you might be delivering code to a customer which um, might actually break under under stress or um, under certain situ situations may, um, may not perform well. So continuous code inspection is part of the continuous delivery chain of develop, test, check the quality of the code, deploy, deliver to customers. 
and that's where our, our product comes into in this pipeline um, in the part of the continuous code inspection process. And the last term which we'll um, which we'll talk about is Snowflake service. So Snowflake service is where um, is, is, is again another Martin Fowler term where he discusses um, when you deliver things into an environment, you want to make sure the environment is consistent as possible. So that each each delivery is uh, deterministic by having um, unique or by not having all your configuration available when you when you build services or build servers or build environments, then you're not going to be guaranteed that you're going to get, going to get the expected outcome. And I bring this up now because our, our product does deal with um, some configuration uh, and deployment um, for message brokers. So it does look at your uh, MQ configuration and your database configuration and your, um, your ANT scripts for deploying things to make sure there's, that there's consistency in those, pro in, in those artifacts and the in the code that it analyzes to make sure you try to get the same outcomes or same artifacts delivered. Um, I'm running in development as you do when you go through your test in your pre-production and production environments. Now, does anyone have any questions? We'll just have a quick uh, three second pause. So we'll move ahead, um, just because um, time is precious, and I want you, everyone to be able to get back to work. Um, so the last, um, so the last article um, here is just discussing using Sonar Cube and continuous integration. Um, so it's just uh, just another another look at. Um, just another look at how this continuous integration code inspection so our product can be used in, in, a, in a development operations process. Um, and this particular article talks about Java, but it's it's, it's um, but uh, but similar sort of process um, for um, for message broker. And this article talks about some best practices. Um, and I, this. Uh, these articles are available from the agenda page. So if you um, if you want me to send it through again, please just um, send me an email or, or let me know. Okay, so that's that's what we're trying to achieve with the product, and we're just going to go through that some of that process now. Um, so what we have here, um, what I have here, is essentially just Sonar Cube running on my desktop. So there's lots of options for deploying Sonar Cube. Um, um, so I'll just take a, a, a quick step back. So Sonar Cube is the product or the open source product um, for doing uh, code management, code quality management, and continuous, continuous code inspection that the MB, MB Precise product integrates with. So Sonar Cube itself has a whole bunch of um, different plugins. It's an ecosystem for a whole bunch of different languages, um, which you can look at if you go to the Sonar Cube website. Um, and it has a whole different, lots of different um, functionality. Um, and what we've developed is a um, message broker specific uh, plugin that sits in, sits within this Sonar Cube ecosystem that allows us to, to make use of this um, code management uh, infrastructure. So kind of Sonar Cube itself is 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 a combination of a server uh, which shows a web, web page, and this here is just one we've just analysed previously. But I'll show you. We'll just go through the analysis process. So basically. Um, what I've got here is a standalone um, environment, and what I'm just doing is running something called Sonar Cube that uh, goes through the code that I've checked out here, runs um, runs the Sonar process over the top of it, which then reports all the uh, issues, violations, and metrics that it finds um, into the Sonar Cube dashboard. Now, the Sonar Sonar Cube database, or the Sonar Cube database behind behind the scenes. And what the SunoQ database is, it tracks these changes over time. So as we, we progressively make changes to our code and we run the analysis over time, we should see patterns develop of, of our code quality. 
So when we um, we talk about things like technical debt and violations and metrics, what we will see over time is um, hopefully I hopefully we'll see our technical debt going down, our violation number of violations going down, um, and our complexity going down as we as we analyze the code and, and refactor it to be as uh, effective as possible and maintenance as maintainable as possible. So in this case here, I've just finished the analysis. The analysis uh, is. Um, has now published the, its findings into um, into Sonar. We can see here on the dashboard is uh, we just see that we've just had an, uh, we've just run our analysis and we've got um, a project here. So we're just going to dive into our project. And we're just going to go through a few of the the features of Sonar and, and be precise. So probably the, we'll just quickly go through the metrics, which is the thing on my left hand side here. Um, so metrics is, well, metrics are information about our code, but not necessarily, um, but may may not, may may not necessarily tell you there's a problem, but may indicate there's a problem. So when I say um, may tell you was a tell you there's a problem, um, we're talking about things like lines of code and complexity and um, and length of uh, flow processing things like that. So some of these metrics could indicate an issue, but they need to be investigated. That doesn't necessarily mean there is an issue. So things like complexity, you may have potentially complex pieces of code. And so we'll, we'll dig into some of these things like complexity. So we'll, for example, we'll look at uh, EOSQL complexity. So we'll, here we're looking at the um, cyclometric complexity of our ESQL files. So what this is what this is giving is, is an, an, an understanding of how many paths are there through our, uh, through our, our source code. Um, which gives us an indication of how hard our code is going to be to test and maintain. The more the more paths, the more um, the more test cases in theory we have to be executing against our code to ensure that all the different uh, conditions are and uh, and permutations are covered. So in this particular case, it's just giving us an indication to say that this is our, our most complex piece of ESQL, and uh, it's complex because we've got some. Um, We've got some loop, we've got a loop, we've got a loop which has some uh, if conditions and else conditions. So we can see here there are a number of different paths through our code. Now, um, depending on the quality of the code, we might decide this is easy to understand or hard to understand for our developers. Um, but by giving us, a, by giving the developers and, and architects a metric, it gives them an entry point or a place to start looking at the, the complexity. So by looking at um, the order of the complexity, We'll see the complexity. Um, but giving an order of complexity gives an, a, a different place for developers to look. So and it gives both the the highly complex and less complex. So for example, here we've got a um, uh, we've got a um, a DAB bus mode mode that does nothing. Um, so at the opposite end of the the complex schedule, this particular piece of code doesn't seem to do a lot, just always returns true. So this might be something that we can refactor so we, we don't have a call to something that uh, has only one return condition. Um, so I'll just jump back. So that's um, the cyclometric complexity measure. So there are a whole bunch of different metrics that we would develop for Message Broker. Um, so for example, cyclometric complexity SQL, the flow length. So the flow length looks at the longest possible path through our message flows. Uh, and this is important because this can affect A, complexity and B, performance. So um, in the case of our backlog six long flows, we're saying that as a um, that it has a node count of 10. So if I just bring up my, um, my toolkit, and I'll go find backlog six long flows. Just one loads. Okay, so backlog six long flows. We can see that um, there's a couple of different paths through the through the, the message flow. Um, so the exception handles the short path. One, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the longest, the longest path through our code is actually the main, the main path, I guess you call it. So, um, so it looks to be like the most common path. So this here is, could be indicating that this particular piece of code may need to be refactored because there's a, quite a few, there's quite a few nodes in a row doing it for doing that process. Um, so maybe we can look at whether or not that can be refactored um, so that uh, the common flow is the shortest flow, for example. Um, but yeah, and then, then, then that gives us an idea of how, how costly this particular process may be to run. So if this is a, a fairly unusual process that doesn't run very often, we might just simply just accept that it's got this many steps and that's it. Um, if this was the most common thing and we were looking to do this, um, this particular process thousands, tens of thousands times a day, then this might be where we will be looking at for our performance gains. So there are a whole bunch of different metrics here. Um, I won't go into them all in, in, in all that detail just so we can keep going on for the rest of the presentation, but node, nodes, uh, input nodes, output nodes, uh, soap input nodes, and soap request nodes. It's just some general information about the, the amount of uh, process, well, the, the amount of inputs and outputs for your, um, for your message flows. Uh, the three RCD nodes are uh, something for uh, people to keep track of because they are they can be quite uh, expensive and there are alternative ways of processing them. So if you start getting a lot of them, you might start looking at those particular flows to see whether or not um, they can be refactored um, or simplified so that um, they're not, uh, there's not so many of them. Again, the flow of length indicates that um, where message broker might be spending the most amount of time during its processing or where our most complex flows are. How ESQL complexity looks at how complex our ESQL. Our string manipulation load. Now, our string manipulation load is looking at the amount of string processing that our ESQL files are doing. So what we're looking at there is um, how many string functions a particular uh, piece of code is doing. Um, so if we look here, um, so we look here, we can see that there's a whole bunch of string uh, there's a whole bunch of um, string work we're doing. So lengths, we're doing a length, we're doing a substring, we're doing another substring. So um, if we had a, a, a huge amount of string complexity in some of our ESQL, we might uh, look at whether or not there's alternatives using ESQL to do that string manipulation, such as um, Java and regular expressions, um, or whether that, that, that code could be um, simplified. Um, so whether or not we could merge substrings together or something, something like that. Our, um, the last one we'll, I'll probably cover um, in detail is the weighted string manipulation. So it's very string, very similar to string to string manipulation, but we, we put the term weighted in there to, to talk about um, how it could be how it could affect performance if we're doing it iteratively. So in the case of when we're doing for loops or while loops and we're doing string manipulation, that might be potentially a lot more costlier than having um, one long one long, fairly simple function with no iteration in it. Um, so where we've got um, nested um, string manipulation functions, we try to we try to bring those to the front in, in the metric by um, giving them a weighted score. So the, the higher the level of nesting within, within iterations, the higher the score. So something that's two or three or four loops deep would have a very high score compared to something that's just a simple um, if statement. And the last one is the um, the cyclometric complexity of map files. So this is looking at um, message maps and the number of, of, of steps through a message map. So we'll just jump in here. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, complexity of zero means that there's doesn't isn't really any alternative path. So if you look here, the complexity is is, is fairly simple because well, there's only one path through the code. Um, if we look at this side, uh, the most complex one. Oops. We'll see um, that there's actually a number of different paths through the code. So there's an, an each, a for each loop, another for each loop, an if condition with a test, 
uh, and else another condition embedded within that. Um, so there are a number of different uh, permutations we'd have to test within this particular uh, flow that's calling this uh, message map um, to make sure we're testing all the, the combinations. Okay, so that's that's the violations. There's a couple of standard, uh, sorry, that's the metrics. There's a couple of standard metrics in there, um, lines, files, statements. So they just, just give you more or less general information about um, how complex or how more complex or less complex your project's getting over time. Um, now, the next one we're talking, we'll quickly talk about is duplication. So um, when we're talking about um, PMD and we're talking about copy-paste detection, this is where um, duplications comes in. So. Um, it's a little bit, um, has to be read with a little bit of um, thought because the code that's automatically generated from Message Broker Toolkit has a lot of things like um, copy message headers and copy entire message. So they show up in the duplication reports. Um, just the nature of the Sono product doesn't allow them, allows to easily filter them out. So um, they do show up in the duplication reports. So you need to be a little bit warier in reading them. but. Essentially, the, the idea is uh, the duplication checks on the number of similar lines of code. So in this case here, we've got um, we've got some violations, um, and we're saying here that um, this code here is duplicated. Um, uh, show details. So we look here. Show details. Um, we're saying we've got eight, uh, we've got eighty three blocks of you know, eighty three lines of code in this function are duplicated now. Um, so in our cube five, it's not really clear exactly where that duplication maps to, but one would guess if you look at these two um, tasks, so you request a leg legacy approved task and request a legacy approved task. We can see just by visually inspecting that. Um, they are actually very similar. In fact, they are the same piece of code. Um, so this indicates that we've um, either on purpose, on purpose duplicated some code, or by accident we've got um, rather than um, writing a common function, do a piece of work. We've we've um, just copied and pasted code around so that um, so that we've got similar function that now flows. So. Um, that may be your architectural approach, but most programming languages, the, the approach is to um, write common pieces of code because then that makes it easy to test. And if you have, if you are in the habit of developing uh, testing frameworks for a message broker, then you can test these functions by creating messages that go in and come out and, and putting different uh, inputs and outputs and making sure that you're testing these functions that way. So we'll just take a quick 10-second uh, breather. Does anyone have any questions before we get into um, violations? And the last bit, which we'll be diagramming. No, no questions? Right, okay, well, last, um, we'll get on to violations, which is probably the most important part of, um, of what we're trying to do with the plugin or what we're trying to do with continuous code inspection. So violations are... Uh, places where we're deviated from our coding standards or in the case of our, our trying to make a product like fine bugs and PMD where we think we've found a, pro a coding problem. So violations would be, could be any number of things related to complexity or coding standards or bugs. So violations have this thing called um, uh, called a quality profile. So in the case of our quality profile, the quality profile tells us what's what do we think is important about our particular violations in Sona. So they've got a, a level. So we've got blockers, critical, major, minor info. Um, so depending on how you want to um, your code or how you want to develop, um, there's 167 rules and you might pick up certain rules to be more important than others. So just in, this is like the standard setup, but what you can do is, um, depending on the type of coding you can do, um, I'll just have to log in here to change it. We can change the, um, the 
level of a particular defect. So what we can do is we can um, we can change the severity. So if we click here, change the severity of a particular defect. Say, well, it's only actually any, it's only major. It's only, sorry, it's only a minor issue, not a major issue. So by by changing the severity, you can get different outputs, and it will affect what you consider your technical debt is, and we'll consider um, the quality of it will change what you you consider your quality of code is. So, for example, what I've done then, I've just changed the qual. I've just changed one of the the um, the um, severity of one of the checks, and so when I rerun the analysis, um, we'll probably see that the um, the number of issues has actually changed slightly. Okay, well, I should have. Okay, so we've still got 179 issues. So, what we can do is we'll just jump into some of these issues and have a look at them. So, Sana itself as an ecosystem has plugins, and these plugins allow you to do things like ignore an issue, um, convert an issue into a JIRA, um, assign an issue to someone, um, close an issue so you're not going to fix it. Uh, I'm, I close an issue to say it's um, a false positive, so that might be a problem in the. Um, particular coding uh, situation that doesn't quite uh, match the rule, but the rule's still firing. Um, marketers say, well, we've decided it's not that important um, and different um, different statuses here. So, for example, we can, add, we can leave comments about the particular violation. Uh, we can assign it to someone. Um, and if I had uh, some users set up, I could pick a user or assign it to them. Um, and we can make that you know, change the severity of the of the violation on the fly um, as we um, as we look at them. So the usual workflow is, or you know, maybe a, an appropriate workflow is you develop a checks and some code, you run the analysis. So someone comes through as part of a review process, looks at the the violations or the new violations that have occurred, decides whether or not they um they're important enough um, for the developer to have to go back and rework to make sure that we've um not releasing code with potential bugs in them or um, additional complexity or, or we've missed coding stand. So we'll just go okay, through a couple of these things, a couple of these violations. So um, so we open this violation here. We're saying in this particular piece of code in the backlog flow timer, we've got a couple of uh, couple of violations. One to say we don't have a header. One to say there's nothing in the file. Um, one to say we're not using a schema. Uh, and one to say... Um, that the subversion comments aren't in this file. Um, so we'll see here we've actually got a, a couple of different comments, a couple of different violations, all, all reasonably similar. Now, the reason they're split out into different violations is you can turn these things on or off, or you can change the severity of them. So you might decide that you're not worried about the subversion comments, so you'd turn that particular rule off, so um, you wouldn't get any violations related to some to, to comments, but you may be interested in whether or not the comment block has been properly filled in with the, the company header details and vice versa. Um, empty file, um, it sort of says, says itself, you know, if you're checking in, if you're checking in files with nothing in them, either developers forgot to check the code in or they've deleted the code and that file really doesn't need to be there anymore. So you can go remove it from, from version control because it's just a bit of noise, it just a bit of, adds another level of confusion or um, it just adds a little bit of annoyance to the developer if they have to open up files that don't have anything in them. Um, so we'll just go back to um, our list of violations. And we'll just go through a few more quickly. Um, input no violation is not commit, it's not set to content in, va in value. So what you might be saying, what you might have with your flows to say every time you develop a flow and you've got an input node, you want to validate the input nodes. You want to, the input node to validate the correctness of the um, of the incoming message against the, the schema which has been assigned or against the, the message type that's been assigned to make sure it's that it's valid. So it rejects it on it, it when it comes into the queue rather than rejects it pathway through the processing. So this affects how your um this affects how your flows may, may process messages, but you might decide this is a standard because you want to have all your failures up front. Um, 
again, here we're looking at um, um, so we're looking at um, transactions, um, pass timing, whether or not you completely pass a message on the way in. You might decide just your standard is you should be passing all your messages. You might decide your your standard is not to pass them because you don't want to uh, potentially, if you've got large block messages, you might not want the um, performance hit if you're not looking at the whole message or you're just doing routing, for example. Um, the input node is no catch handler, so you've got a node with no with no exception handling attached. Um, so you might decide that you have a standard where all flows need an exception handler and you're going to go through the um, the default back out queue for the, which is to find the queue manager or whatever, to find against the queue, or you might decide every flow needs a, every flow needs to go through the standard uh, um, the standard exception handler, in which case you'd have one violation for there is an exception handler and another violation to say there is an exception handler. So you just pick and choose which violation or which rule you want to have run depending on your coding standard. Um, so no catch handler. Um, you might decide that you prefer using Java nodes. You might decide you prefer using SQL nodes. You might prefer decide you should be pushing developers to use mapping nodes. So we have checks to say um, if you don't want to use uh, Java nodes, then every time it, uh, the plugin finds a Java node, it raises a violation to so say you've got a Java node in there. Are you sure you want to have it? And by having and by setting some of these rules to, um, for example, to um, Resolvers won't fix every time that rule comes shows up or that violation shows up against that particular file. Sonar is smart enough to know that it won't re won't re raise that back to the user because you've already decided you're not fixing that. Um, right. So that's um that's some of the issues. So we'll just um. Hopefully that gives everyone a good idea of um, the sorts of things that um, we're checking. There's 167, 168 checks that we have, and probably best things have a look at through the backlog and have a look through our, um, our manual, which is available from our website, which gives you a much better idea of what all these checks are, um, rather than trying me trying to go through um, all of them today. Um, so that's violations. So violations leads us into something called build breaking and quality profiles. So quality a quality profile and a quality gate um, allows us to set a line in the sand to say this is the amount of quality we're allowed. This is the minimum amount of quality we have in our in our code. So what you would ideally want to do is um, for new development you would set that quality level or that um, number of um, violations quite low, and as devel as developers reach them, you would start kicking the work back to them to say, well, you, you violated some of our coding practices, please re redo your work and, and try commit again. For ex existing code bases, you might have that very high um, or a lot higher threshold and then you re release that, reduce that threshold over time to try and um, get um, bake in a bit more quality and reduce, uh, reduce the number of um, coding issues and improve the quality over time. Now, this is actually implemented with something called a build breaker. So what we see here, when we've run this analysis, we'll see that um, we'll set up a, quo a profile to say we're only allowed to have 20 critical issues and we've got 179. Um, but it hasn't hasn't really done anything. It's just a big red big red square, big orange square to say um, we've, we're approaching our our quality threshold. Now, Sona has something called a build breaker, and what this does it works with the quality gate. Um, and the number of, and the violations that Sona detects um, to time with the analysis, and I'll just have to restart Sona when I turn this turn this on. What this does is it works it works with the uh, with the violations that it finds. Um, and works with the quality gate and quality profile you have, and that determines whether or not the the software is a high enough high enough quality to release. So what you would you would include this is in a continuous release process where you would develop, have some develop make make some code changes. You'll build automatically build your software either on the spot with the check in or at a predetermined um, time of day. 
you would run your sonar analysis over the code. Depending on the quality of the code, you will decide whether or not you would want to release that code to the next environment. So in the case here, I've, um, I have Jenkins running. Uh, and so what I've set up is a, I have a, um, I have a set of a, a Jenkins project to run against my, um, my demonstration code here. Now this demonstration code is just being checked out of subversion, but in this case, it, it's already been done. Um, and we've just said we want to run our solar analysis app. We'll check this out. So on a, on a build pro, on a build pipeline or in a continuous delivery environment, this would be would might include more more uh, more jobs. That so might be a, the checkout. There might be this solar analysis, and then might be assuming the solar analysis uh, works, might be deployment to a to an integration test environment. In which case, you might run some integration tests on it. But our first gatekeeper of this, of stopping this process, is our code quality. So when our code quality falls, we can decide that we don't want to release that software until someone fixes it or addresses it. So what we'll do is we'll rush, run our build now, and assuming that Sono has successfully restarted. What we can do is we can follow our build. Now we're just starting this manually, but what we could do in a continuous integration environment is we could have this um, process uh, run every time a developer checks in a code or every hour. Um, so what we can do is when the build breaks, we get um, we allow Jenkins to actually send back the feedback of an email or a, or um, or in some cases people have tied Jenkins into some sort of third party siren system. So when the build breaks, you get a big flashing red light. Um, so what we can see here is we've run our analysis and Sonar itself has come back and said, I've failed because the build broker said there's too many issues. Um, so if we go back into our, into our demo, oh, sorry, if we go back into our, Our dashboard, we can see that we've got a quality aid as a big red X, and that indicates that our build is broken. Um, so at this point here, Jenkins and failing the build would then be able to go and um, would then be able to go and email the appropriate people. Um, and if we look at our Jenkins dashboard, we get a big red 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 box or a big red circle. And if we have enough broken builds, we start getting a um, we start get start getting a cloud over our Build. So if we look here at our um, some of our builds, our builds broken. We see we've got a um, build stability is, is is dropping, and there are plugins for, for Jenkins to, to monitor the build stability and do different um, feedback to developers and managers depending on what what um, how you configure it. But in this case, all we've done is we said we've broken the build because. Um, because our code quality has fallen, and that code quality has fallen because we've got more than the set number of violations that we've we've said that our developers can have. Um, so we've built a fairly simple, um, fairly crude continuous integration process um, that we can use um, to feed into our continuous delivery model. So that's the basics of, of, of Sonar and how you can use it to build uh, to build code quality into your um, into your development process. In the last couple of minutes, I'll talk about um, an additional piece of functionality we've added into our plugin called uh, uh, for diagramming. So diagramming um, isn't isn't a standard thing part of Sonar, but we, what we've done is we've taken the model that we need to build to create all our violations and we've taken that and we've, we're going to generate some on-the-fly diagrams. Um, we do this because A, it helps developers understand the, the Sonar um, code quality reports that, the, that we'll be now getting back. Um, but also it's just a, a useful thing for message broker developers to be able to communicate with each other and be able to understand the architecture a bit better. So it's pretty simple to configure. What we do here is um, Pick one here. Um, so what we have here is we've configured a property to say when I run this analysis, I want um, to generate some diagrams into a particular folder um, 
available from the sonar. So this could be a mount somewhere. This could be a web devs uh, environment. This could be uh, some some sort of tie into Confluence or it could be something Apache's reading. In this case, I've got a simple web server called Mongoose reading this um, this output directory. So now that I've run my analysis, I can go into my um, open up my browser. Uh, and I can and I can open up the um, the generated pages. So it generates a whole bunch of different files, and, um, but it's based on uh, um, mainly on a, a, a subvert um, SVG di diagram and a, and a web page. So this one here, this here is a um, is a S SVG representation of uh, the integration between the flows in our system based upon um, input and output queues. So we'll be looking to improve the quality, um, doing some more with this um, in the future because um, it just looks at queues, it doesn't look at aliases and it doesn't look at publish and subscribe and that's something we'll be extending on later. But at the moment it just looks at queues. So what we can see here is, um, for example, we can see here we've got a flow where the input of the flow is the same as the output of the flow. And this might bring some alarm bells with your architects to say, well, why is there a flow writing to itself and doesn't seem to have any other outputs and doesn't seem to make sense. So this is a, this is, so this is a good way to, um, to kill your broker if you put a, a message in that just keeps replicating to itself. Um, otherwise, what we can see here is if I just um, make sure I just reload this page to make it... Um, but as you see, what we can see here is we've got some other flows here um, where we've got interactions between the flows. So we can see the particular flow here takes a message and then um, feeds off to another, another integrates to two other potential message flows. Um, so what this gives you is just a general, general diagrammatic representation of how flows and has flows and subflows and uh, queues are interacting with your system so if you know you're making some changes to a particular flow it gives you an idea of what the the downstream consequences could be so for example if i'm changing this particular flow i might need to just i might need to go check the um the logic of this flow because that's the one that's consuming it um, and you can never go around. You, it gives you a bit, bit more information about um, different um, different components. So that's the first part of the diagramming that we that we generate on the fly. Um, the second part is is the architectural summary. So what we've got here is a summary of um, all the different uh, components, all the different components we're finding. So in this case here, we're finding um, we're listing out all the um, all the flows that were found and a description of the flows. We'll just see if we can just filter this by um by uh, okay number of um yeah so number of um we can just uh, change the number of um items we see in the list at once um so here for example we can dive back into our diagram um. And this just gives a when we say a summary, it just gives a bit of information about the documentation we've got. For so this is the this is the combination of the notes and the comments that we've found about this particular flow, um, and we're populating it here. Queue summary just gives an indication of where the queues are used. So, for example, um, this particular queue here is used by well, it's only used as an out as an input to data is an input to data power. So in this case, we don't have a a link because we're we're not representing. Um, data power in our diagrams, but it just tells you how, how parts of systems might interact. So, for example, we might um, look at all the um, data power, or we can see all the, um, not all stones are false, but we can look at sorting by, oops, sorting by um, data power. So we see here, these are the queues used by data power. Um, so in this case here, some of these queues are used by data power. Let's have a look. And yeah, man, you would see here if there's an interaction between data power and Sterling that, or data power message broker or message broker and Sterling that, um, that would have yeses. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so this is information about how the queues are interacting from message broker out to the outside world. SQL statements is a is an ex, is an extension of our SQL checking. So as part of a, um, one of our rules or coding rules is, is and also trying to avoid the um the concept of we're trying to enforce the snow the snowflake or prevent the snowflake setup. We check the um the tables and column definitions of the SQL that we find within your SQL and your message flows. Try and make sure that the tables and um, the tables and columns are represented in the database. So they do exist in the, in the development database you point out and then also does some cross-checking against the indexes so if you're doing an update on a non-index table which would generally cause a table scan we like to flag this as a violation to say well this might be a performance issue that you, you might not see now but when the table gets big enough you'll start seeing that issue um, so this here is an extension of that so what we're doing here is we're attempting to, to extract out all the SQL that we find and um, build build the SQL out in a presentable format for our, um, our DBAs and our developers to talk together about. So in this case here, we're taking the SQL uh, update statement and trying to present it back to the DBA or the or the person that's doing the review. This is the actual SQL that's going to get going to get run by Message Breaker. So this gives us a way for our DBAs to review and help out and um, look at the quality of. Oh, and the performance of the, the SQL that Broke will be running um, without having to try to understand all the, all the, all the code there that's actually in, in Message Broker. And by publishing this out as a, as a web page, either through Confluence or WebDAV, it's, it's a very easy conversation to have with them. So every time you publish it, they can just, um, they can just go have a look and see what's, see what's there. The rest of these are just general summaries, so data sources, properties, uh, common SQL methods. So, um, so for example here, oops, so for example here, we've identified that we might have, this is a particular uh, common PSU SQL and it doesn't seem to do much, um, which is a bit of a warning sign, but in the case of um, some of the other commons, common things we found, so we found a common, it looks like we found a common piece of code um, that sits outside. Um, that sits outside any particular uh, module. Um, so we can now consider this you know, common. Um, so it just gives you um, gives the person who's um, using this um, these diagrams um, the ability to to have a look around the code to see what sort of common functionalities are already there without having to write something new. Um, so if you had if you had a fairly exhaustive set of functions, um, a new developer would be going, would be able to look through this to see what other functions have been written, where else in the code that might do something similar to what they're looking to write or something they're looking to change. Um, a summary of all the Java, um, Java code being used and where it's being used from, a summary of all the stored procedures and where they're being used from, a summary of the events, um, a summary of um, files being read, files being written to by broker, um, a summary of all the input URLs that this particular um, piece of code or this particular set of codes listening for, um, a summary of all the output URLs or the output points that um, this particular code will be integrating with. Um, a summary of the so the input input also includes the um the type so we've got a SOAP input or a HTTP input and the same with the output we've got um, HTTP requests or whether or not there might be a SOAP request exceptions and this is just to help you um to help you standardize your um your exceptions and exception descriptions so we've got the description from the exception and the exception code um, it will be produced so if you've uh, got designated exception numbers that you want to use um, or if you want to pass this page on to support um, for them to understand where exactly a, a, an error code and description might be coming from. So this is good for enforcing standards and also um, hopefully communicating with them um, with people. Uh, data, power, data power inputs and data power outputs. So this here is looking at the uh, data power code that the uh, message records uh, analysis has found. And so we're looking at um, where data power is reaching out to the outside well. Um, so in the case of when there's two products um, bundled together, the message record and the data power one, um, <clears throat> because they both have to deal with them, 
with style sheets. Um, when we come across some data power style sheet, we do some analysis work um, and we generate different rules and violations. We run different rules to generate different violations for data power. And we also include that within our, our diagramming. So we're just about out of time. So I'll just um, stop there. Hopefully everyone got something useful out of this presentation. Now, um, are there any questions before I, um, I let everyone go? Ah, well, um, it sounds like everyone's a bit, gone a bit quiet. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully you got something from it, um, whether or not it's purely from um, a point of view of learning about our product. Um, as I said, Sono is something that's uh, it's a rich ecosystem. So even if you're not thinking of using our product and you work in other development environments, um, hopefully this gives you some ideas of, of what it can do for um, all sorts of different types of development scenarios, not just mess stroke and data power. Um, and I will let everyone um, get on with their morning um, and go get their coffees or whatever. Um, thank you for joining me. And if you have any questions, please email me, um, uh, which is available on our contact page. I'm also available on LinkedIn. Um, and the website's just bettercodingtools.com. Um, yeah, just um, fill the contact, uh, contact form and kick me over an email. And, um, and um, yeah, let me know how you go. Um, enjoy your morning, and I will um, hopefully chat to you later.